everybody, and a special hello to everybody that's joining us online. Thank you for joining us, wherever you are. Welcome to the British Library. It's the home of words and people who love them. Um, and guess what? It's our birthday. So we've <laughs> that's why you couldn't get in, because the whole building's been shut down, and we've all been eating cake all day, so it's very exciting. And shush, Nikki. <laughs> and it climaxes in this extremely gorgeous event. I'm extremely excited. So it's 50 years since the Act of Parliament that separated us from the British Museum. They're kind of our mum. Um, and we house over 107 million items. It's a living collection that gets bigger every day uh, with freely accessible archive from every single era of written civilization. And I do want to alert you to the very particular joy of our reading rooms. If you don't know them, there are nine reading rooms and there's another one in our Boston Spa Yorkshire site. Reading rooms are truly something so special um, and they're free. Not everybody knows that they're free. You don't have to be an academic or doing a PhD on medieval manuscripts. You can be anybody as long as you've got two forms of identity proving where you live. That's all you need. And it's some of the poshest chairs in London town. They're amazing. So please avail. So in the spirit of the love of reading and to honour our five decades, we have this shimmering panel of writers here tonight. Um, and they'll celebrate their own and others' literary treasures for your delight. Books are on sale afterwards, so make sure you fill your boots. Um, and to introduce you to the ingredients of tonight's delicious feast, I'm handing over to the chef, the international superstar broadcaster and your favourite radio presenter, Nikki Bainey! So which was the hardest to write? I think probably, I mean, they all feel like I'm dying while I'm doing them, you know. They're all, they're all hard in their own special way at various points in the process. But probably I'd have to go for Love Marriage, which is my latest one. Um, I mean, it had been a 10 year, it's 10 years since my previous book mm. came out. So that gives you an inkling that I, I was finding it hard to write. Um, and I wasn't working on that book the whole of the time, but I did have this sort of massive crisis of confidence which stopped me writing for quite a while. So I'd have to say that it was Love Marriage. And I also wrote it in a very different way to my other novels. In how so? Uh, well, for the previous ones, um, I edited a lot as I went along and I ended up with very tight first drafts. And for Love Marriage, I just kept writing and writing and I ended up with, I think it was 250,000 words or something ridiculous. And I knew I was writing too much and I felt that I was doing it in the wrong way, that this isn't my process, um, this isn't how I write and I'm not going to be able to cut it in the right way. But actually, when I came to do the editing, I, had, I cut it in half. Don't worry, it's not. It's nowhere near <laughs> that long now. I cut it in half. But actually, the, the editing process was fine. So what I learned from that was it's not about my process. It's about the process of each particular book and what that needs. I just want to ask, interrupt this slightly, to say, have you ever had a period, David, when you haven't been able to write? Oh, yeah, I mean... Uh, what I do you do? I didn't write anything at all during the lockdowns because there was so much, not just anxiety, but kids around and homeschooling and all of that. And uh, I mean, I, I, I'm lucky in that because I jump between uh, fiction and, and scripts that if, if, if I really don't have an idea for a novel, then I, I, uh, hopefully there'll be something else to work on. And scripts, are, it's very hard to get stuck with scripts because not only do you have deadlines, but you have all these voices and all these people offering suggestions, too many suggestions. <laughs> and so uh, the, 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 um, with, with a novel, uh, I, I can't really write. And when I got really stuck after one day, I bought this at, at my lowest point. Uh, I was trying to write in a different way, in a more freeform way. And I got this terrible piece of software because I thought maybe I need to write in a sort of freer, more freeform sort of stream of consciousness way. Terrible piece of software that you, you started typing, and if you stopped typing, it started to delete what you <gasps> <laughs> And I got it as a kind of experiment. Just I thought you were going to say it electrocutes you. Yes. Just to see if it made me more productive, that I'd have write this. And, and, and just to make sure that I like, just get, I get at least a thousand words a day down by just writing like this for the <laughs> 
And it was all nonsense. I mean, it was all like a kind of weird, you know, when you write down dreams and then you look at them the next day. <laughs> it was like that. And it really wasn't the way that I naturally write. I really need a, a, an idea pretty much in its entirety before I start. Can you remember what that was called? I mean, that's just anxiety making, it's called isn't write it? Write or die or something. Oh, right. Write or die. <laughs> okay. I don't know you can produce not a single useful sentence because I, 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 I'm not, I, I know there are novelists who do improvise their novels or plays or poetry and I, 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 because I started as a screenwriter, I, I tend to need a pretty tight synopsis before I start. I'm going to ask you the same question, Roger. Um, well, I did draw it once, but only for a week, um, <laughs> not, which wasn't bad, really. Um, but no, it's, it's easy. I mean, it, poetry. It, um, if you write all the time, I found, uh, for life, that the more you write, the more you write, in a sense. If you start writing, um, you finish the poem, you need to start another poem to get away from the poem you've just written. In a way. It <laughs> moves you on. Yeah. In a way. It's, it's, you're always propelled by the, what you've already written. And that's quite important. You know, you, if you just sat there waiting for, you know, some, the blessed gift to come, it wouldn't. It might not come. So it's in the it's in the writing. It's in the speech, it's in the microphone. It's in the voice <laughs> um, where it is. So um, I've always had something to to, to, to work on. And it's different. I, I find it hard to write a novel. I think um, it's all right. Is everything all right with the mics? Anything I need to do? Is it me? Um, B will find okay. out. Do you want me to pause, B? Okay, okay I'll carry on. Carry on so, David, you too are a best selling, much translated author. You're a rather successful screenwriter. More on that later. From Starter to Ten, adapted mm. for film. About to become a musical, I believe. Yeah. Um, through to the understudy, the global bestseller One Day, which became a hit film, Us, TV series, latest novel, Sweet Sorrow. By the way, didn't you write most of One Day in the British Library? I did. I wrote, I wrote the first four novels between here and the London Library. Yeah, and Humanities too, um, which I loved. And it's true, you know, it's a great place to come and work and I, if anything, it was too much fun. It was like a nightclub on a Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> and the room, different rooms have a different atmosphere. And Humanities 2 was, was definitely the kind of chill-out room. And um, I, really, I really loved it. In, it, it. in the end, it got almost too distracting to, to come here. So now I, I work in a little quiet office by myself. But, the yeah. physics department is quieter. Oh, really? <laughs> well, their maps I always liked as well. That was, really? Uh, yeah, that was a good spot. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked Monica. So you've got the okay. choice of which to answer. Which one of those novels I mentioned are you most fond of and why? Or which one was the hardest to write and why? Uh, I, I'm, I'm very fond of Sweet Sorrow, which, which um, you know, often the, the, the work you love the most doesn't necessarily do, as, do, do the best. I mean, I, nothing, I'm sure nothing I'll ever write will sell as many copies of one day, but Sweet Sorrow was the one where I thought there was the, the, the smallest gap between what I wanted to achieve for the reader and, and what's on the page, which isn't to say there's a not a lot, uh, uh, there aren't many things in it that I'd change if I if I could. But I I, I was very f I felt that it had the right warmth and sort of bittersweet tone and a uh, mixture of comedy and sadness. And even though it wasn't autobiographical, it felt very personal. And I, I I'm, I'm 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 very fond of that one. Um, but. You know, it's a bit like the further back you go, it's a bit like looking at old photographs. You sort of, you have to hold on to the idea that, you know, things were okay at the time. I mean, I find there's definitely passages in Start of a Ten and The Understudy that, I, that I'm that i embarrassed by and that oh, I would write in a radically those. different way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think when I started, I was very, um, I was very, uh, the early novels, because I thought they must primarily be comedies, they're, they're slightly neurotic in their comedy, in that they're, they're, they're jokes, 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 jokes. It's like someone at a, at a party who's constantly trying to make people laugh and not saying anything. Mm. And, and, I, I, and so I find the kind of the relentlessness of the humour and the fact that a lot of the humour is about uh, embarrassment or social humiliation, I find uncomfortable now. I, I would try not to do that now. Um, which isn't to say that, you know, I want to, I, I want to disown them. I, I just am aware of the things in them which perhaps now seem to me a bit facetious or, 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 or frivolous or not well achieved or, or um, uh, yeah, a bit immature, I suppose. But I was, in, you know, I was a, an immature writer, so it's inevitable. You were, you were younger. 
I, yeah, I was sort of learning how to do things. And I, I was a screenwriter before I was a yeah. novelist. So I, was, I wasn't aware that, you know, you could, you could stop and tell the reader how, what someone was thinking or feeling. That was the thing I had to learn. So I, I can definitely see myself learning on the page and that doesn't stop you know I'm sure in in a few years time I'll look back at Sweet Sorrow and think what what are you thinking but um, (laughs) there's nothing you can do about that. Roger McGough the patron saint of poetry godfather of modern poetry which title do you prefer? Um, (laughs) (laughs) I'd go for the patron saint I think. Patron saint okay Patron Saint of Poetry, poet, broadcaster, host of Poetry Please on Radio 4, a hundred books published, possibly more actually. You failed English literature at O level. I want to know who failed to help you appreciate Thomas Hardy. Well, it's funny you should say that because I blame Thomas Hardy. Oh. Uh, I, I remember now, I remember taking, I went, went to school and um, I, doing English, I, Passed English language at 15 at O level, but I failed English literature, so I never went beyond 15 to, to do literature. Um, the reason was um, I didn't read the set books. I mean, you're 15, the other things to do. And it was Thomas Hardy, it was the, the Mayor of Cla- Casterbridge. Yes. I, was, I was at Clatterbridge, coming from Liverpool. <laughs> Mayor of Casterbridge. Um, never got through to the end of it, and so failed. Oh, level. So I never did it beyond that. So I bring this up because, of course, David has made some Thomas Hardy for television. Yeah. Oh, I didn't have that in those days. We didn't have yeah. television. <laughs> there you go. Crip, you know, it was all, so that could you know, have really changed everything. We used to sit around chewing bits of lino, you know, and, 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 <laughs> reading um, Thomas Hardy. But um, <laughs> but that, so that was it. So so and then I went uh, when I went to, to university. I went to Hull, and uh, I did French and geography because they were. My big marks I was best at, without really having anything in mind to do. And it was at university, and because Larkin was the the warden or the sub warden of the hall of residence I was in, um, and I was only seventeen and, and very gauche, and, and he he wasn't either of those things. And um, <laughs> but I, it was the instant he was a poet. Then I listened. Remember, one of the one of the students had a an LP of Under Milkwood. Mm. And that's me sitting to listening to Richard Burton uh, talking and read the poetry, and that sort of really came alive. And the French poets, and, and that sort of thing. As we have Monica Ali here, maybe we can touch on your summer with Monica, spelt uh, differently, obviously. Yes. But yes. many people have described that as their gateway into yeah. poetry. Yeah, yeah. I was about to say, I mean, when I was yeah. that, the, the age you were just describing, I got summer from, uh, with Monica from the, from the local library. But yeah. I can't imagine having the confidence to go out and buy a book of poetry, I'd have felt very self-conscious at that age, but it was the first uh, poetry volume that I read in one go, and I thought it was really remarkable. So it's a bit... <laughs> Why do you think that I collection really cuts wonderful. through? Thank you, thank you. Yeah. I don't know, uh, interesting, isn't it? Because it was an age when I was just um, put writing a lot of poems and poems about loss and all those things. Adolescent, I was in the early 20s, I suppose. And, but I remember going past the Everyman Theatre in Hope Street, Liverpool, and I'd... There's a poster outside for the Ingrid Bergman film. Uh, yeah, Summer, Summer with, with Monica. Monica. And, uh, which I never got to see, but uh, never got the film. I saw the poster, and this beautiful girl without any clothes on, <laughs> looking across the lake. And, ah. and uh, I don't know where she was looking. It was back in head or, 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 or London or somewhere. And, um, but I was, I was, and then having given a name to it, M-O-N-I-K, Became all the sort of imagined girls in, in the, the would be's and the had beens and the yeah, will never be in the book and, and the story. And it came on and it became a sort of narrative. You know. Have you ever read any of those? We need to get you the collection. I if have, we have, I have. Oh, you have? have. Yes, oh. a long time ago. In, yes. In, in, no, I love no. them. <laughs> 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 so um, you have a new collection of poetry coming out next year. Well, it's not a new collection, but a the, the coll- a, a collection, yes. A, a, a co- huge collection. collection yeah. um, but I wondered if you might read one of your latest poems for us or recite it. The one commissioned by another library, the Poetry Library in it, South Bank? It, or do you want to read something no, else? No, I'll do, no, I'll do, I'll, I'll, no, no, the one you mentioned, yeah. Um, yes, I got a call from Chris McCabe at the British Library at South Bank. And he said, Roger, will you write an acrostic for us? I said, if you tell me how to spell it, I'll, I'll have a go. <laughs> <laughs> and 
you probably all know about ekphrastic, E-K-P-H-R-A-S-T-I-C. And what it is, it's a Greek word meaning a reaction, immediate reaction to something, a visual, perhaps, a painting, or in this case, a photograph. And uh, it was for the uh, Eurovision in Liverpool, it was happening earlier this year, as you know, and there was an exhibition of Ukrainian photographs at, the, at a gallery there, the Open Eye Gallery. So the commission was to write a poem responding to a photograph. So it, it, this is called, it's called Call Me World. I am land. I'm happy for you to live on me, till and plough, graze your cattle, build your homes upon me. I will feed, nourish, even bury you, but I'm not yours. Not yours to fight over, to invade and plunder, divide and destroy. I do not belong to you. Even though you claim me, I am not yours. I have no name, flag or anthem. Call me world. When I make you angry, call me names. Earthquake, wildfire and volcano. Call me tsunami, tornado, but do not call me China or Russia, Ukraine or Taiwan. I am not your Israel or Austria. Your America or United Kingdom, I am land. I have no name but earth. Call me world. I will sit for your landscape paintings, pose for your cameras, for your songs and poems, be a source of inspiration, but I'm not yours. Japan, Pakistan, choose a name. Iran, Afghanistan, one and the same. You come and go, only I remain. Call me world. I'll bring this closer and you can have that. Well, you have all had works taken to the screen or the stage. You've adapted somebody else's work or taken your own. David, you, as you mentioned, were a screenwriter before you wrote your first novel. You've adapted your own books for film. One Day, Start of a Ten, Us for TV. Mm. You've also adapted Shakespeare, Hardy and Dickens for the screen. Yeah. Yeah. And you wrote the brilliant Patrick Melrose series for TV. But I understand that audio books help your process when you're dealing with a classic. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly with the Thomas Hardys and, and the Patrick Melrose novels, uh, you sort of have to learn the books really just good. I mean it, it depends what the brief is that the Shakespeare I did was um, a very loose adaptation of much ado about nothing turning it into a kind of modern rom-com for the BBC and with that the intention was to you know to have fun and show the links between you know the first great romantic comedy and the, the genre of screwball comedy that we know today and so that was a very loose adaptation it had a very small section of Shakespeare in it uh, a lot of paraphrasing and references but 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 quite a loose adaptation. But with something like Patrick Melrose, the Patrick Melrose novels, which I really loved, then the, the brief is really, for me anyway, to, to be as faithful as possible, not in terms of action and dialogue, but just in what the novels made me feel and finding the way to put that on the screen. So um, it's, it's, it's much easier for me anyway to, 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 to listen and just learn them to the point where I know exactly what's coming up, that if I have the book in front of me, I can find my way around. Uh, Melrose, Edward St. Auburn writes amazing dialogue, so I was able to, to, um, to learn a lot of the dialogue and, and write it straight onto the page. And it's just a, a, a slightly le a more active way of, of um, familiarising yourself with the material in such a way that you can add your own stamp, but, 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 um, but put the essence of it on, into the script, yeah. And tell us about the musical because that's a very different Ooh, adaptation. It is. I wish I could tell you more. Oh, you're not allowed I, I'm, to. I'm, I'm, I don't know. I, I, You've got I, nothing I've, to do with I've it. I've kept a certain distance because... Um, Are you not writing the music as well? You're I'm so not. multi-talented. <laughs> I might audition, but I, I'm not going to. <laughs> no. With, with, um, with some things, I think it's best to, you know, to step away. I think especially if someone is, um, is doing the adaptation and is inevitably going to make changes... I don't think you ever want to be in a position where they feel they need to ask your permission to do things. And, and also, because I sold the film rights, I, it's not even up to me. So uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled it's happening, and they're really lovely people. It's a brilliant team, but I, I will probably not see it until it opens. Okay. But we're also doing a, a new adaptation of One Day, and with that, I'm not writing. This. I've written one of the 14 scripts. 
So it's for television. For television, for Netflix, yeah. And it's, uh, it's epic. So I, I, there's a, uh, the, the, the lead writer is a wonderful script writer called Nicole Taylor. And she really doesn't need my notes. And again, you have to find a way to, um, to, to step away a little and allow uh, the changes to happen. Because, you know, adaptation means change. If you, you, there's no point just reading the book out loud. You've got to bring new qualities to it. And, and so with that, uh, um, it was a little unnerving, but I found it actually really enjoyable to, 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 um, to find a middle way between being controlling and being <laughs> entirely distant. Uh, I, 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 see all, I see all the cuts, I, I uh, read all the scripts, but I also always hold in my mind the, the notion that it isn't, it isn't mine in the same way that the novel is. I, I was mentioning earlier that I'm talking to Karen Slaughter tomorrow, yeah. whose books have been made into a television series. But the television series has a completely different uh, a person of colour in one role, yeah. a Hispanic person in the lead role of Will Trent. And I had read the first book hearing about this blonde hair and light skin. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about changes like that? Again, I think it's, it's part of the process. And I, 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 as a viewer, I want to watch television that reflects you know, the society yeah. we live in. And when, I, when, when one writes a book, one is you know, limited by one's own experience. And television is a far more communal uh, medium uh, and uh, you know, in an adaptation of One Day, it was played by Amber Kamod, who's, who's uh, 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 of Indian heritage, and, and she's absolutely phenomenal. And that isn't what's in the book, but again, it's an adaptation. It's something that we've we've thought about and talked about, and, yeah. and um, it is, I hope, uh, I, what I think absolutely wonderful. I mean, I really, I really, really love this version. It's been, it's been incredibly uh, exciting to work on, and we'll see. And as a screenwriter who then became a novelist, who still writes screenplays, yeah. do you think that you've changed the way you write your novels with the expectation that that will at some mm. point come onto the screen? Um, I always start to sound a bit defensive because I, I genuinely no, I think try not thing. to. I, mean, oh. I, try, I, I think there are so many things you can do in a novel that you, you immediately have to just cut when you put it on screen. You, there's no room in a screenplay for, well, memory is very difficult. Memory is a great tool for a novelist, but, and it's very hard to do because on screen it inevitably means a flashback, and different actors, and there's prosthetics. So there's a kind of fluidity in the way you use time and space in a novel that's very hard to put on screen. Uh, there's no metaphors in screenwriting or similes. <laughs> you know, it's about what people say and do, mm. whereas the novel is about what people think and feel. And, and, and so I would never dream of not writing the best possible novel. And at the same time, I know that as a novelist, one of my biggest influences is, is TV and film. You know, it's, it's, it's there in the dialogue and in the, the set pieces and in the, the way that they tend to have a three-act structure and in the way, I think, in terms of scenes, uh, where you come into a chapter, where you leave a chapter. So I, 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 for me, um, you know, I grew up reading novels with the television on and the two mediums have always been intertwined for me. And, and so there are definitely aspects of my fiction that I recognize are, are uh, dramatic and adaptable. But also I hope things that will never, ever, ever find their way onto the screen because they belong to the medium of prose. I'm really interested to hear you say that you grew up reading novels and watching mm. TV. Does yeah. that mean that today you've got your tablet, your mobile, no. your games <laughs> thing? No, and, no. no the, now the mission is to avoid, to avoid all of that completely. When I started writing, I could, I could have music on, I could, uh, there could be noises coming from everywhere. Now I'm, you know, it's all about the noise-cancelling headphones. Right. You know? <laughs> um, no views, nothing. I, I don't have the concentration to, to do anything other than just write now. Monica, your book, Brick Lane, was made into a film. And you have, I thought, been adapting Love Marriage for the screen. Do you want to talk about giving your work away to the screen? How does that feel in the beginning? Oh, well, it was very exciting with Brooklyn, and it all went very smoothly and quickly. And Abby Morgan did the screenplay, who's gone on to do yeah. you know, great things since then. Um, I mean, it, it, it is peculiar going to see the, the sort of rough cut of the the film, because I hadn't read any of the scripts. I 
thought I did that thing of mm. staying completely yeah. out of it. I thought, you, you know, you shouldn't interfere. It is a different yeah. animal and I don't want to be there going, no, but you've missed that bit out. Mm. So, so I just stayed away from it. And then seeing it for the first time was, um, you know, I was a bit nerve jangling yeah. before I went in. But then actually I really thought it was great. You know, yes. I loved it. And it's different from the book and there's things that maybe I would have done a bit differently but you know I didn't do it so, yeah um. yeah but nothing so so bad that you were upset no no, no, no. and what about love marriage so um love marriage I have been working on an adaptation and um, was it it's in it's in development hell do you know that yeah. okay. have you heard that phrase yes. well that, are you that's allowed to tell is. us more not really. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, well, okay. How about you tell us what were you writing the screenplay? Yeah. So, so um, I mean, before the book was published, there was a, there was, uh, you know, again, it was very exciting at the beginning. There was an auction between, I think, it was twelve different production companies were bidding for it. So I was thinking, oh, this is a dead search. You know, this is definitely going to get made. <laughs> I was like, you know, so naive of me. Oh, and it was commissioned, yeah. but the, the script was commissioned by the. The BBC and it's now sort of stuck in um, development in, hell. Yeah, yeah, limbo land. So maybe mm. one day, one day. Yes. Maybe <laughs> one day. <laughs> Were you about to give some advice? No, I yeah. got it. <laughs> no, I really wasn't. No, advice. no, no. I have my own <laughs> development hell experiences as well. I, I wondered, you when you were, did you draw on the other? the larger version of the novel, or did you work very closely with the published novel? I mean, you said that there was a kind of a longer... Yeah, well, I mean, actually, that, that, that's an interesting question, because I did have all this mm. extra material, yeah. so I, I've got so much story. And yeah. I think that's one of the things with turning a novel into a, um, a TV series, is that it's such a hung, story-hungry format, yeah. Yeah. medium. Mm. So... Um, you know, a, a novel can get very quickly eaten up in terms of story, but I've got loads of story. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of the actual structuring of a film or a television series, series did you did you need help with that, or have you just got an instinct? Um, a, a bit of both. So, mm. you know, it's something that I've been interested in for quite a long time. You know, this wasn't my first um, attempt at dabbling and, and, and trying to write for the screen. One day, something might come to fruition, um, but, you know, I, I live more in hope than in expectation. But, I work, I mean, it's a much more collaborative process anyway, as mm. Dave was yeah. saying, yes. and the production company that I'm working with, New Pictures, are brilliant yeah. and really good at hand-holding, and I love that back and forth, and I think that's one of the reasons that I'm still keen, despite mm. all the frustrations, to do it just the enjoyment of working with other people in a creative process is something that I love, actually. It'll happen. Yeah. It will. Oh, well. I've, got, I've got a good <laughs> feeling. Um, Roger, you have adapted a number of Moliere pieces, mm. Tartuffe, for example, for the stage, mm. but perhaps you would rather tell us about your family musical Money Go Round, because... Well, that's been adapted from your children's book. It's just been at Glastonbury. Yes, You're headed right. to the assembly rooms in Edinburgh. Edinburgh, that's right. Tell Finished. us about that. Or would you like to talk about Molière? I was going to go on about Molière, actually. because oh, it, 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 it shows me in a sort of, you know, clever intellectual... Intellectual. Part, yeah, but, but so I won't. No, I'll cut to the... Uh, no. <laughs> no, that was great fun. Just doing the... No, doing but can we... Well, people do know that you speak fluent French and you did... Lit do they? Do, I doubt it. No, I do don't. you not? Uh, no, no. That um, you... No, That's what speak. you studied at university. I did. You're not flu don't teach fluent French. God no. You do. They don't. <laughs> I got. To, uh, no, I spoke with a, a bad uh, Irish accent. Spoke French with a bad Irish accent, and um, taught by Christian brothers, uh, Irish Christian brothers, who uh, was the the carrot, the carrot and stick methods of education, uh, without the carrot, and um, <laughs> and they, they all spoke with Irish accents. So I, I just went away to university to do French, and uh, you know. I used to hide away, really. And when they came round, you know, start started to speak, speak French and talk and read out French. And I'd always manage not to... No, I'd wait for the bell. I'd always sit somewhere where the bell was going to ring before <laughs> you sat, you know what I mean? And so you missed out. Uh, I was discovered in, in the last year that I hadn't spoken. Anyway, 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 anyway. But when I was asked by Gemma Bodnay at Liverpool, uh, would I adapt Molière, a tattoo uh, for Liverpool's 
city of Europe, European city of culture, mm -hmm. 2009. And I thought, I've not really, am I good enough? You know, you, you always think that. Am I able to do what other people have done so well before? Um, but once I started, um, I just did. I gave voice to, to, the, to the people. Didn't think about it. And mm. I, I, I read from the prose. <clears throat> Actually, I read from the prose versions. Right. And, and a photograph of Molière on my, next to me, on the, on the, and I'd just go to him and kept, kept it sort of simple and... and what do you mean you'd go to him? You'd, would you talk to the picture of him, you mean? Or he was what? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, yeah, some nods. And nothing, 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 nothing weird. <laughs> Was that weird? No, I just uh, <laughs> no. So you know, you didn't mean just. I need his affirmation if you yeah, go and go for one. You know? I get it. But the funny thing was then I, I so I did the first Molly. It was all in rhyme because I'm, I'm good at that. I'm good. <laughs> good rhyme. But when it when it came to the second, well, I was asked him. Success was you know, the first Tatif. Next one was the hypochondriac. Tim said, "Will you do the hypochondriac for us?" I said, "Okay." And I was going on a saga cruise. I used to be asked, invited to go on a saga cruise uh, to to work on them. You know to to uh, workshops and perform, yeah, yeah. And um, so I, I took the, the book, the prose, spent a lot of time, did the first couple of acts, all in rhyme, pretty good, came back, gave it to Gemma, delighted, to find out that Molière hadn't written it in rhyme. <laughs> he did the whole thing in prose, so, so I've got <laughs> no. this, this uh, verse version. Anyway, well, that was a great, real yeah. adaptation, that was then, wasn't it? it? <laughs> But, yeah, sorry. But, uh, Tell us about Money Go Round. Yes, Money, money Go Round, sorry. It was, a, it was a children's book, came out at Walker Books uh, two years ago. And it was set in the Wind and the Willows sort of uh, landscape, the Willows. And um, Mole is a lady, Lavender Mole and Ratty. And uh, it's just that lovely. Bit. And it's about money and about how money is not important and is important to some people. And so the coin, someone pays a coin for the, for the job they've done. And instead of then going spending it, they pay somebody else because they owe something for what they've done. And they think, shall I spend it on, on new clothes? No, I must give it pay somebody else. And so the, the coin, coin goes round. Anyway, the book came out nicely and uh, I decided it'd be a nice musical. So I took it to the OSO in Barnes and uh, worked with some musicians there and directed and it became a sort of little success. And it, it's, it's nice, good. To, to do. Yeah. Do you take part? No, I, do, I don't know. Okay. No. But will you be going to Edinburgh to... No, I didn't even go to Glastonbury. I could oh. have gone to Glastonbury, but didn't... Uh, would you have gone to Glastonbury? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Maybe yeah. not to see a children's or a family musical, though. No, no, Maybe no. to do no. more go, of the oh, things that the Beat Poets I, did. That's right, yeah. yeah we'll talk I about did. that in a minute. No, okay. No, it was fine. <laughs> so it's, that was good fun. You have each chosen a book from a different decade of the British Library's life. And Monica, tell us about your choice. Uh, OK, so my choice is The Buddha of Suburbia by Hanif Qureshi. Mm. And it was published first in 1990. And I read it when it first came out. I was in my early 20s. And I have to say, I inhaled it. It was like oxygen. Mm. I had never read anything like it. So I was entranced and enthralled and thrilled and it was the first time that I was reading about a Britain that I recognised, a multicultural Britain and the protagonist is the product of a mixed race marriage as I am. As I am. <laughs> yes and, um, and that was a first yeah. for me. Um, so it's set in South London suburbs over the decade of the 1970s and um, the narrator is a 17 year old boy when the book opens um, but there was so much that I recognized from my own experiences my own life when I started reading about cream so I just want to read um, if I may of the first course. few sentences my name is Kareem Amir, and I'm an Englishman born and bred, almost. I'm often considered to be a funny kind of Englishman, a new breed, as it were, having emerged from two old histories. But I don't care. Englishman I am, though not proud of it, from the South London suburbs and going somewhere. So there's just so much in those just 
first three sentences, you know, it's so fresh, so direct, so strongly voiced. And within those three sentences, Kareem announces his nationality three times. Yeah. I mean, the first time almost with a hint of apology, mm -hmm. with that almost. And then by the third time, he's saying, um, that he's sort of expressing a, a defiance, you know, yeah. not that I'm proud of it. Yeah. Um, he's claiming it, but he's not proud of it. So it, when I read it first, you know, 30 odd years ago, it sent a shiver down my spine and um, it still does, yeah. really. I've been rereading it and it's still as funny as ever. I mean, it makes me laugh out loud. It's just um, exuberant and energetic and such a joyful read. So if anyone hasn't read it, yeah. I bet everyone in this audience has well, read they, it, but anyone you, has You've sold it, it for sure. <laughs> so um, you, you've mentioned the fact that there's a mixed race person that spoke to you, spoke to me, spoke to many other people. Um, Did you read it back oh, then? Oh, yes. Yeah. And yeah. For me, I know I don't look mm. like I'm half Indian, but I am. And I, but it was also the fact that he was a, a wannabe actor. So yeah. all the things that I wanted, he was in the arts and his, yeah. mm. but the other thing was how people exoticized yes. his Asianness. Yes. Did you, what, how did that resonate with you? Yes, so um, I mean, he's very, I mean, there's so much to unpack and talk about in this book. As there's you know, loads of sex. <laughs> there is a lot yeah. of sex With everything it. you can imagine, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, back to exoticism. Yeah, back to exoticism. I mean, the, 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 the issues about around race and racism run the whole gamut, don't mm -hmm. they? So from, um, you know, being spat at at school, um, being racially abused by Helen's father, this is a, 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 a early girlfriend of his, who just hurls racist abuse at him, just sort of straightforwardly, yeah. um, uh, you know, insults, to... Um, when he goes to London. So the book is divided into two parts, the suburbs and then London, which is where he wants to escape yeah. to from the stultifying boredom. And he thinks that the people are going to be much more sophisticated and open and liberal there, and in some ways they are. And then there's also a different kind of racism that he suffers from. So he, when he gets to the theatre first, um, but he gets his first acting role. It's his Mowgli in um, The Jungle Book. <laughs> yes. And um, he, <laughs> he's chosen to be authentic <laughs> and then covered in brown body paint yeah. and has to put on a fake, fake Indian accent. So, you know, there's all, there's, you know, there's, there's <laughs> it's also hilarious. It, it, it's very funny. <laughs> it is very funny. And what did it, I mean, did, did you recognise the politics of those? So you're, I don't know, you didn't grow up in the 60s, but would you, did you recognise the 70s politics? Did you feel what you might have felt at growing up? Yeah, so, I, so um, I mean, you know, things weren't that different in the 80s and the yeah. 90s, and I was a child, I was a child in the yes, 70s. Yes, in the 70s, But, yeah. you know, that sort of, um, certainly the over-racism, but, you know, when I was growing up in Bolton was, you know, I'd walk home past National Front, um, you know, graffiti and swastikas mm. and all of that. So there was all of that around. And then, you know, coming to London and faced with those sorts of... Um, well, it's not, it's not just around identity and race. It's also around class, actually. It because is a, he's, yes. ve he's very, very... He's as perceptive and nuanced around issues of class mm. as he is around race. So, you know, the book starts in... Bromley, which is a sort of lower middle class neighbourhood of the twitching curtain respectability mm -hmm. variety. And then I should say the Buddha of suburbia is Kareem's father. father yes. And he has a lover called Eva who lives in Beckenham, which is um, st mm. still sort of lower middle class uh, uh, as he describes it, mm. but more aspirational. Yes. And then he goes and uh, um, his father, Haroon, um, who is a renegade Muslim ma masquerading as, as, a, a, as a Buddhist. Guru, yes. yes. <laughs> That's a line from the book. A yes. renegade Muslim masquerading as a, as a Buddhist. So he goes and gives these yoga and meditation, Eastern <laughs> mystic sort of classes to people in Chislehurst. You know, which is, <laughs> and they <laughs> which, love it, which, don't they? Which is even posher. It's all about affluence and status yep. as well. And then there's all the class issues in... 
London. Yeah. So that's very stratified and laid out. And as an outsider, Corinne is very hyper aware of all of that, as was I, you know, um, growing up in Bolton, growing up on a council estate. I'd gone to a private school because I got a scholarship. So all of those, I was also very hyper aware yes. um, of, of all of those issues. And there's a very funny bit where he goes to, um, he goes, to, he describes a journey to St. John's Wood, which is like his intellectual mecca. And to him, he says it's as exotic as going off to Marseille or somewhere. And he's going to see another even uh, more um, high profile theatre director who actually is just a sort of, you know, abysmal person who, um, you know, it, all these hollow arty types yes. are then contrasted with the, um, Jamila in Brixton, um, who is his childhood friend. And that's where the politics comes in yeah. more strongly to the book, through Jamila. Through Jamila, exactly, and her sisterhood. Um, so politics... Um, all kinds of class identity. issues, identity, racism, sex, sex, yeah, fluidity, fluidity, colour, yes, sold. <laughs> so that really summed up a lot of the sixties and seventies, and I think a bit of the eighties, didn't it? Yes. Um, thank you for that. And you did your moment by reading out the beginning. Oh, I know what I wanted to do. Um, Professor John Sutherland wrote a book called How to Read a Novel, Not How to Write a Novel. Mm. And his point was, using Marshall McLuhan, the futurologist, as a yardstick, you don't judge a book by its cover, you pay, turn to page 69. What's on page 69? 69. Yeah. <laughs> Why 69? I'm not being smutty, that's what he did. <laughs> yeah. He said, don't judge a book by its cover, turn to page 69. If you like what you read there, you know, but this just read one line. But this book, you should judge by its cover. It's yeah. a Peter Blake illustration. Yes. So, you know, um, Good point. Somewhere yes. Shall I read it? Yeah, you find one. Page 69. Um, he looked at me with amusement. Much better, he said to Helen. Dad's in the head hospital. He's coming out next week and keeps saying he's going home to Eva. Really? Eva living with her own husband again? And so on. Dad's in the head hospital, that says something. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> I can see what you're doing, David Nichols. Well, What's on page 69 of your book? <laughs> the book, a... do you want to tell us what the book is first oh, and yes. then do page 69? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Marilyn Robinson's 1980 novel, Housekeeping, um, which I think is a masterpiece. It's a great, great book. And the, page 69 is a lot of dialogue, and I don't want to do the accents. So <laughs> I'm not, not going to do that. But... Um, should I talk about it? Yes. Okay. So yeah. um, tell us why you've chosen that. Well, I'm, I'm editing at the moment, and, and, and with editing, you, the hope is always that you kind of, you have this kind of microscopic attention and concentration, and that you make sure every sentence is perfect. How you, you, you read, when you read about other writers' techniques, like Don DeLillo prints out uh, his novels a paragraph at a time and works on each of the paragraphs and makes them... You know, gives them the kind of attention that you give to a poem, you know, to make sure that every word is, is the right word and in the right place. And, and, and so that's what I set down to sit down to do. And inevitably, after a while, you just think, oh, this is fine, this is fine. You know, he opens the door, that's fine. Uh, she walks across the room, that's fine. You, it's very hard to, uh, to maintain that level of, of, of um, quality in prose over the, over the, the scale of a novel. And yet, I think this is one of the few books that, that does that. And I keep it by my side, really, just because if I ever need to remind myself what brilliant, beautiful prose can do, it's, it's, one, of, it's one of the few books that does that. It's, a, it's a, in many ways, a very classic uh, coming-of-age novel uh, set in the uh, Pacific Northwest. It's never mentioned, but it seems to be the 1950s, about two orphan sisters who, uh, who lose their mother to suicide and are then looked after by a series of relatives and end up um, being looked after by Sylvie, their aunt, who is charismatic, irresponsible, has had a past as a, a, a vagrant. It's, it seems, seems to have a, a strange, distracted quality. And uh, as, they, as the, the, the years pass, the sisters grow apart. Uh, Lucille becomes more conventional and Ruth stays loyal to Sylvie. And... Um, it's a really uh, 
powerful book written in very clear prose that sometimes has a very straightforward quality and sometimes has a, almost a kind of King James Bible richness and, mm. and quality to it. It's, it's intensely moving and mysterious. It has this extraordinary atmosphere of, 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 of water uh, and cold and, and, and greyness in this small, uh, narrow-minded town of Fingerbone. Fingerbone, yes. Yeah. And as the novel uh, proceeds, the, the prose style also changes. You know, it becomes more and more heightened. The ideas become stranger as, 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 as Ruth finds herself drawn closer and closer to this strange character of Sylvie. So it's an in, intensely beautiful book. And one of those books where I read you know, a, a page and just think, well, this is, this is a writer who's doing something different. You know, quite often the books that you really, really, really love aren't necessarily the books that you... You, you have it in you to emulate. And, 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 but I, I think it's still great to have those, those touchstones uh, to remind you of, of what, what, a great, what great writing can achieve. They, they are, where, whatever decade it is, they are living outside the conventions of society, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, can, can we do spoilers? No, let's not. No, I no. think, yeah, I think... I'm yes, because yeah. pe some of you would probably be tempted to read this later. Yes, please do, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, and I find it very, very uh, moving, but not in any, at any point in a, in a way that's, that's mawkish or manipulative. No. It has, it has um, a, a, a very eerie and, and affecting quality to it. So is there a passage or a chapter that stood out for you that... Um, that I resonated in some way. I didn't want to uh, read uh, anything uh, very long. I suppose there were just a few passages that show the different, the different modes of writing that she has. I mean, this is a very, a very straightforward passage, which I find very moving, where she's uh, towards the end of the novel looking back at, at the loss of her mother, and it just seems to say so much about the... the, 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 the well... Um, then there is the matter of my mother's abandonment of me. Again, this is the common experience. They walk ahead of us and walk too fast and forget us. They are so lost in thoughts of their own, and soon or late they disappear. The only mystery is that we expect it to be otherwise. I just love the, the precision of that soon or late rather than sooner or later. It's just um, really exquisite. Um, I, uh, what was the other passage? I turned so many corners that... I, do, do them it's all. It's really unhelpful. <laughs> <laughs> Abandonment <laughs> but, was the big theme for me in that book. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and, and again, the, the, the moments which you'd expect to be big, dramatic, emotional, moving moments, things that I know that if I were writing a book, I'd really, you know, I'd really milk. They're, they're, just, they're just passed <laughs> over in a sentence in the most, uh, in the most elegant but, but powerful way. Um, uh, look, I really should have made clearer marks because I'm just staring at pages now. But oh, I, all I will say, oh yeah, here, here's a beautiful passage. I mean, this is more, this is more heightened, but she's t talking about a memory she has of going for ice cream with, with, um, with her mother. We sat at a hot green metal table, weather dulled and sticky, and loud black flies with rainbows in their wings fed at the pools of drying ice cream and then scrubbed their maws meticulously with their forelegs like house cats. I don't know how someone does that. I really don't. I mean, it's no, another one talking about a, a terrible picnic that Sylvie packs. Uh, I found a bag of marshmallows among the odds and ends that Sylvie had bundled up into a checkered tablecloth and brought along for lunch. A black banana, a lump of salami with a knife through it, a single yellow chicken wing, like an elephant, like an elegant, small gesture of defeat. Uh, again, I, I, it's, I it's full of this kind of thing, and I, it's a really... I think it's one of the, the great novels of the last century. And Thank you very for that. About it. Um, I was going to say, we could say something to Hanif Qureshi because he may see this. <laughs> he's getting I, better. I went to see him last week. Oh! oh. So he's, he's back in London. He's, um, I mean, in hospital. Yes. Yeah. But he's been able to get away from Italy. Yes. And he's recovering. Mm. Oh, well, I'm so glad you chose that. Roger, yours is the only choice that I hadn't read and also couldn't <coughs> afford to buy because it's such a rare... It's out of print, so will you tell us what you've chosen? Yes, well, yes. I, I, yes, I, I thought I'd better go for uh, a poetry book, really. So I think that's what I've ended up doing in my life. And there's a book that came out in the 1960. Uh, you probably all got it at home, um, called The Beat Scene. Um, and the cover has Jack Kerouac on, on that. Now, the thing about this book was that 
It was at the time when I was at university, I came out and uh, came out, I came to university in um, 1959. And um, this was the book that's round and about. And I just started writing my poems and not knowing whether they were any good. I didn't think, I knew that I'd be writing poems. Whatever I did in my life, I'd write poems. I didn't mm. think it was going to be a career or anything at all. And um, I mean, my, my first poems, I, there's a chap in the corridor in the hall of residence I was in, and I took him the first poems and said, you know, a friend of mine sent me these poems. What do you think of them? You know, and he told me. But um, I still kept on writing. <laughs> <laughs> It, it didn't matter, and I, I felt I never belonged in a sense. And there's a uh, there's the university torch, there's the, the magazine, and it seemed very to me, to me at the time intellectual posh, as if like um, people dragged into the poem the, the, the what they'd learnt in other things, you know, the, the, the furniture of intelligence, which left me. To that. Anyway, so I went back to Liverpool, and um, then at a time met up with Brian Patton, who was a journalist at the time, and he was eight years younger, uh, Adrian Henry, I met, who was a, a teacher. And then I came across this book. And of course, what was happening in New York and San Francisco at the time, and it was the big beat generation of poets. And the whole thing about the, they were still writing in the 50s. And this is a time when America was really tremendously capitalist. It was going very well economically. It was like most of the world, but America particularly, that their sense of, America is great. And the hippie movement and the, and the beat movement, they were against all this. They were against that. They were not important. That was important as long as you have money to feed yourself, to clothe yourself. That's, that's it. The rest is unimportant. What is important is the soul. Beat, is it beat seen as in jazz or is it, as in Kerouac's case, beatitude? Mm. Blessings. That's what it is. We are blessed. And that was the thing they had. And I carried that on, that, that idea of being, sounds silly, but to go back to when I was brought up in Liverpool, um, uh, just before the war, there was a war on. And uh, I remember being taken out into the shelter at the night and uh, bomb was falling and there's, my dad worked on the docks, there was no money and anything like that. But I was always told how lucky I was. My parents always told me this, that Roger, you're very lucky. You know, you've got parents who love you, you've got a nice sister, you're lucky, you're uh, lucky you're a Catholic. Lucky to be a Catholic, you could have been a Protestant, <laughs> you know, straight to hell. Um, um, lucky to be Irish, I said, lovely, you know, lucky to live in a Liverpool, you could have been born in Manchester. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or London, wherever that is. You know. And so you're also brought up to think you're, you're lucky, and in a funny way, that sort of stayed with me, you know, in the, and that, it's, a, it's good, you know, rather than never felt envy, you never felt the other people having better times elsewhere. It's a really important lesson. And this beats him, Beatty carries on. Get back to the poems. I mean, it's it's uh, it's a, it's an evocation, celebration of the time, of the many many poets. Some of which you'll know, some which have passed and gone and did other things. Um, but some poets became friends. Uh, Kenneth Coke uh, became a friend. Um, um, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, to some extent, and a lot of the poets I met. It's a, it's an anthology of poems, and the wonderful places they hung out. You know, you wanted to be there. Um, you know, I was. And it's funny too, because people have said, in a way, to myself and Brian and Adrian, how lucky you were to be born in Liverpool at the time, writing poetry. Mm -hmm. At the time when there was the Beatles and all going on, you know, so much, you know, how could you not write poetry? But it's not true, you know. You think, well, no, other people didn't, in a way, you know. I wanted to be in San Francisco. I wanted to be in New York. That's where it was all happening, Carnaby Street. Not Liverpool, you know, which is <laughs> a dull. It's where you, where, you, where you come from. It was always seen as that. So this was just an exciting um, refrain. I felt part of something going on, exciting out there, of which I wanted to be part of. And some of the poems um, spoke to me, the playfulness, the lack of seriousness sometimes, sometimes very serious, you know, um, and, but other times playful, you know. Mother, why are all the young people from the 20s so suspicious? Mother, all this stuff. Will Robin you read Nichols. one for us? Uh, I, I, no, I, no. I'd rather read my own better. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but can you... <laughs> Is there a particular poem that stayed with you for any reason? You don't need to read it. Or are um, they all... No, I just, I just remember the, 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 
the po- the, listen, listening to the poets, and uh, uh, again, Ferenghetti, um, Leroy Jones, all the people. I could pick up one or two here. Um, but I, I failed to, I did to drugs do them with justice. Timothy Leary. Did you? Yeah. He's adjacent to the beat poets. Very much so. Yeah. Very much so. Find oh, something like that. You saw then. a few off, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> when did you do that? When? Um, <laughs> at Tony Scott's house. Because Tony Scott and Donna, Tony Scott, the filmmaker, this is pro- I'll probably get fired <laughs> from the BBC now, won't I? It's in my younger days. So I would say that was 1995, maybe? Four? Yeah. Fun. It's not about me. <laughs> come on. Yes, come on. <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, I, so again, I, I felt uh, very uh, partial to this. And I remember going over to um, America once, so BBC sent me over to America with um, a friend of mine called Pete McCarthy. Pete, Pete McCarthy, a comic, comedian, writer, very good lineup. Sadly, that was. But we went to City Lights, went to City Lights, went to where Kerouac used to read. We followed the beat scene there. And I remember going to meeting Lawrence Ferlinghetti, and he showed us around the City Lights bookshop, and the history is wonderful. And uh, he said that's where Corso ran in, Gregory Corso ran in one day, and picked up the, the cash machine and ran out with it. And we had to stop in the police. And, and, and uh, a lovely history. And, and he said, Roger, let's go have a photograph taken. Let's have a photograph taken. BBC photograph taken. I said, myself and um, Lawrence. And I said, I like your, your cap you're wearing. It's one of those baseball cap in those days. City lights. He said, "Hey, Roger, would you would you like one of these guys?" I said, "Yeah." Tommy, bring uh, bring the Liverpool pipe. Bring one of the uh, one of the cap. <laughs> hey, would you like one of our bags of these book bags? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Bring a book bag. You know, I think you know, that'd be forty dollars. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Beat post. No, anyway. So, but look. But it's a grand, a wonderful book. It's history, history, and it's you know, it, it's and, and it's a good anthology. And I just wanted you want to be there. And it has photographs. I love your photographs, yeah, yeah of, of the time and of the place. Yeah, I found a few online, but they were like sixty, ninety pounds. Really? But, because it's completely out of print and a collector's item. Oh gosh. Yes. So. <laughs> my wife's my wife's looking at me. Saying, oh, <laughs> me on that. She's going to go. Let's <laughs> sell all ten of ours. <laughs> Um, thank you all so much. So we can now hand over to our audience here and the audience online if you want to ask any questions of anybody. Um, somebody bravely put their hand up there before. Do you want to be the first person, gentleman over there? I don't mind. I love that. Tell us your name. My name is Jerome. Hi, Jerome. Oh, we've got a mic for you. Sorry, that's my, my mistake. Although you've got you've got a, a real good voice, yes, and you can throw it. <laughs> um, Roger, you had mentioned that you um, well, it was mentioned earlier in the conversation that you didn't pass your English mm. uh, literature O level. Mm. Um, I'd be curious to know um, because you're all, of course, writers. How important you think learning English literature in a classroom setting is to your writing? I mean, obviously, Roger, you've been able to achieve great success without that mm. English literature O levels. I'd be curious to know what you all think of that. Well, it, yes, it's interesting. I mean, what I found, I did find difficult, and, it's, and it's, I, I'm sort of partly blaming the teaching at the time, you know, the, uh, the brothers. Um, also, it was a time when a lot of the teachers had been in the forces, you know, come out of, out of the army, the navy after the war, and they were all dis- discipline was you know so important, and uh, and we were so working class boys, got to get to where it's grammar school, so you got to get a, a job, and so anything to do with anything to do with the arts was, was not important, and you used to get through it. And I remember Shakespeare was spoiled for me in a way, um, given to us too early, you had to read it out, and poetry was always something that you had to. It was tricky, tricky. You were caught out. What did the poet mean by this? And if you didn't know, you felt silly. And mm. what I loved, though, that was, um, and they started to bring it back now in Oracy, aren't they? In, uh, in children that used to stand on stage and recite poems um, on stage or stand in front of the class, right, and recite things like, um, remember the, the the three blind men and the elephant, all those that poem, you know, jo- mm. Jeffrey Saxon, yeah, yeah, all that stuff of that, and the smuggler's song and. Often, you know, the high woman, high woman song, all that, and just standing together reciting poetry. When, like poetry became more like theatre than, mm. than probably than something you study um, 
and forget, answer questions on them, forget. And uh, it was always something that other people had. So, so there must have been sort of a, some sort of gift. So uh, words, language, words, just words. There's too much words used for giving you information and going on to the next thing. You know, it, it's, 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 uh, it, it's imagination, not information. That's where we've gone too much information, information. It's all back to imagination. Do either of you want to say anything about teaching yeah. in the classroom? Yeah, Monica. Well, um, now that Brick Lane is an A-level text, I think it's essential that everybody... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I mean, I agree that, that many good books have been ruined by being force-fed to poor children who... I mean, don't, I don't mean literally poor children. I mean, you know, poor... Um, yeah unlucky children yeah. <laughs> who are not ready for them course, yeah. or it's badly taught mm. and it seems to have bear no relevance to their lives and I think that's why you know a, bit, a little bit more diversity within the the set text is actually a good thing whether it's Brick Lane or you know Bitter of Suburbia or some other book so when you can start to find something that you recognize in a book that's and, when you and also turn with, with your it. books novels i mean they are the stories and people love stories and they? they love stories yeah, they yeah. love from the beginning and also they love poems poems because if they're used the right way poems are, are short children can write poems can, can really write poems they all can do it you know and, and and tell things and you don't have to tell the truth all the time you can tell fibs you can, you can be your own <laughs> hero all the time yeah. get your own no, back absolutely on people. i mean you know we're, we're hardwired for story i yeah. mean i really mm. believe that you know what what does an infant need once it's got food and shelter the next thing is tell me a story yeah you know, so true. babies want stories kids want stories mm. right from the time that they're sitting on your knee so i do think it's a fundamental human need yeah anybody else got a question for any of the authors lady over here oh your step counts going up isn't it as you're running around <laughs> Hi, I have a question for Monica. Um, I wanted to say how much I loved Love Marriage. Oh, and true. I wanted to ask a little bit about the character of the therapist in the book, um, who kind of helps access, um, helps Joe to access these kind of emotional truths. And so I wanted to ask a bit about, like, if you could talk a bit about your portrayal of therapy in the book and whether the therapist himself might be viewed kind of as an author figure with his sort of extra layers of insight into these characters? I don't know, oh, I found it fascinating. Okay. What a lovely question. Yeah, that's the kind of question I like. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the, 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 therapy char the, ther the therapist character in the book is called Sandor, and uh, the reason that I introduced him was because I had uh, a sort of structural issue with Joe. So, jo so the book is, I mean, for people who haven't read it, uh, Yasmin is a young doctor. She's engaged to be married to a fellow doctor, the wonderful Joe, who is handsome, charming, rich, also <laughs> kind and sensitive, but he does a terrible, shocking thing and he cheats on her and then she cheats on him um, and then it all goes, you know, um, awry from there. But Joe is nursing this even bigger secret, which is that he is a sex addict yeah. and he's in therapy for the sex addiction. <laughs> so... Um, I, can't it, all the way back up to I, I wanted, I mean, he's, he's one of the main characters and I wanted to, at first I was going to write sections from his perspective and then I thought that is not the right way to do it because um, sex addiction, it's like one of those things like, yeah, but is it really though, is he an addict or is he just basically, you know, a dick? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not a real thing, so just an excuse. So my, my way of getting close to Joe and not losing the reader's sympathy, I hope, mm. from the get-go was to do all of Joe's sections from the point of view of the therapist so that we understand intimately right from the start that this is a a real issue that he's got and start to unpick um, where it comes from and um, and then I also got really into the character of Sandor and I that was one of the things that I had to cut quite a lot from at the book because I got sort of carried away with Sandor as a character um, how did I, how did I write it? I've been in therapy myself, so that not for sex addiction. <laughs> but, but other things. Um, so you know, I was drawing on that experience from the other side of the therapist chair, and I did a lot of research and reading, 
And yes, of course, there's something of the author's perspective because I was close to Joe and I have sympathy for Joe, even though he, you know, he's, he's not a perfect guy and he's flawed. So I wanted the reader to have that same level of sympathy for him. Good question. Anybody else got a question for anybody on there? Oh, over there. Tell us your name. Hello, I'm Alex. Uh, two points. I'm also a writer from Liverpool, and I just wanted to say thank you to Roger, basically. You can't be a writer from that city without really having you around and on mine, so thank you, Roger. Thank you, thank you. Um, second point for all of you is I wanted to know what your opinion was on the modern publishing industry in the world of, say, like Amazon, and new writers, and can writers really fail nowadays? Can they make bad art without having to give up writing? Mm. Can they do their writing without having to worry about their rent? I j how can that be fixed, if it can ever be fixed, and how would you think you would ever do that? You want to start with that, Roger? No, I'm, I'm listening okay. first. I'll listen. New writers and, mm. and rent, and can that be fixed? I think mm. it's really hard. I mean, I think especially if uh, we're, when we were talking earlier about you know, what, what one gets from one's from studying a subject like English, I think it's harder and harder uh, for people who aren't from certain backgrounds to, to, to spend the time studying those subjects, training in those subjects in the arts and humanities, and then finding the time to, to, to experiment and, uh, and develop their own work. I, 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 uh, I studied English and drama at university. It was a kind of last minute swerve from, this, from something more vocational, what my parents thought of as practical. And uh, it was definitely a risk, and it was definitely frightening, but it was also backed up by a full, a full grant and, and, and no tuition fees. And I mm. know that yeah. five years later, I would not have done it. Mm. Absolutely would not have done it. And neither would I have had the relative freedom after leaving education to, to, you know, to work in bars and, and pubs and low-paid work, but find time to, in my case, initially act and then later write. And I think all of that is gone. Uh, both at the education stage and in that, that often quite difficult, uh, frightening, unnerving, insecure stage after education. So I think that that loss of support is a, is a real tragedy and will, will deprive us of the work of, of, of many brilliant artists and writers. It's, it's, a, it's a real shame and a, 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 a shock. And so um, you know, I'm, I'm aware of my own good luck and in being born when I was and and, uh, and, and sorry that it is, it is so, so hard now. Um, in terms of the publishing industry, I, I, I suppose, I think the biggest change is, is uh, again, you know, I didn't really crack it until my third novel. And I think the publishing industry now is, is very excited about debut writers. And, and of course, that's, that's absolutely uh, right and to, to develop exciting new voices. But a lot of writers also don't quite find their voice or the story they want to tell until a little way into their careers. And I, I hope that, that publishing will, will not lose that, uh, perhaps it already has, but will we'll remember that writers uh, have to develop and, and be nurtured to, before they can really produce their best work. Thank you for that. Monica, do you want to say anything? Yeah, I, I mean, really to echo what David's saying, I mean, you know, the, I can't remember the, mm. the number for the median figure for writers now. The, the, the Society of Authors does a survey every five years or so, and it's just, it's plummeted again. Yeah. It's like, I don't know, £8,000 or something like that. that. So, it, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a real struggle, and I think what used to be, is it still called the mid-list? Mm. I mean, yeah. you could make, a, you used to be able to make a living as what was known as a mid-list mid writer, so that you, you have a respectable number of, uh, of books and you sell a res respectable number of copies and you can make a perfectly decent, you know, if not a, a sort of um, luxury living mm. from that. And I think what the publishers no longer really subsidise, I think they used to cross-subsidise a lot more from best-selling authors mm. to Help keep yeah. afloat... Uh, 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 just a, you know, a greater range of writers. And I don't think that really happens in the same way anymore. On the bright side, you can self-publish, and you know that that has been the route for 
a rising number of writers who don't get taken on by traditional publishers and they publish themselves. I mean, that, that is a great freedom as well. But I mean, how many of those become successes? without the might of the agents well, and the publishers? I, do, I, don't, I no. don't know the numbers, but at least you can get your work out there. At least you can start yeah. to find an audience. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't suit everyone. I mean, I don't do things like social media and marketing and so on. So it wouldn't suit me. Mm. But for some people who are good at um, networking yeah, and getting their, their work out there, I think, um, you know, the fact that there are other means of getting your work out yes. there has got to be a good thing. Yeah, Roger, yeah. anything yes, to well, add? It's, yes, just to, you know, good luck, Anne, but it, it, what, with poetry, for instance, I mean, poetry was always, always seemed difficult, always seemed difficult to have a, find a market for it. Uh, when I was young, I mean, the magazines always be, seemed to be in London or Oxford and whatever, but, you know, but there was a market and there was, was people who went to the clubs and the pubs and so forth and people around. Um, nowadays, if you're a younger poet, um, the way in, of course, is on you know, Twitter, Instagram. And immediately, there are so many poets, as you know, out there. It's huge, huge poets getting published, getting their work out there, which is good for them to some extent, except often in the enthusiasm to get out there. There's less time seems to be spent on, on the making writing. it right somehow. You know, this is the danger, isn't it? You want to be, want to be famous, want to be this, that, and the other. And, uh, you know, it's a... It's a don't do your business. I mean, you don't go into be a writer to, to make money, you know, at all. It can happen. And we are talking before, weren't we? There's sort of, in a sense, um, with David, one of the good things about maybe writing a, a good novel, and maybe that novel can become a film script, can become a play, can become a, you know, it's marvellous, the, the p potential. But you, you can't start off writing a novel thinking, oh, this is, this, this is going to be a film or, or whatever. Mm. It's just, it's your next idea, and you've got to have the freedom and the, the, your sense of it being the right thing to do for you, that you have a gift, maybe, or you see if you have a gift, try it out. I mean, I, I, you know, uh, that's the gift, is, is the writing. Can you come on your radio show? You can, yeah, you, yeah, you can come on my radio show. <laughs> you have to write a, yeah, okay. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> Sometimes you just need a break like that, you know. Uh, does anybody else have a question? Ah, in the front row here, with the great glasses. And um, the mic's coming to you. Thank you. Um, um, hi, uh, my, my question's a two-part question. What's your name? Uh, Michael. Hello, Michael. Hi, my question's a two-part question, uh, in case the first part doesn't stand up. I've got a part two. Okay. <laughs> um, is our poems stories? And that's uh, a question. And the other question is, um, could you tell me the funniest poem that you've read in your whole life? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a two-part question. Is that for Roger or for everybody? Everybody. OK. Who would like to start? Um, I can't think of a... I can't think of no, a but can you think of whether a poem's a story? Um, Have you got anything to say on that? I don't know enough on this. I've been no, very fair enough. About poetry fair poetry. enough. Monica, what about you? Have you got anything no, to say? I, I it's all back to you, Roger. Oh, God. <laughs> I was the same as the novelist. Um, <laughs> there's one poem out. Well, no, I, can I read a poem here? Um, which I thought I might do because it's in a, we're in a library, aren't we? Yeah. Do you notice that? And, um, <laughs> and I, um, there's a lovely library. And it links up to what we were talking about before, about uh, ch children uh, having literacy in school and oracy and things. And there's a, um, an outfit called uh, Clipper, which is the Centre for Literacy in Primary Education. Do you know what it's called? No. The Centre for Literacy in Primary Education. And they do that. And they, they really are very at the front of going out, getting uh, writers into, into schools and that sort of thing, and making it very important to them. And they have a wonderful library uh, built up over the years down in, in Waterloo. And um, the librarian recently retired, so I just wrote a poem for the retirement. So I, I thought, as we're in a library. Nice. I thought, see, I was thinking. I was thinking. <laughs> so this is called An Angel in the Library. The books in the library shuffle on the shelves. The pages all aflutter, talk among themselves. The colours on the covers slowly fade to grey on hearing that someone is leaving them today. That someone must be special to explain all the tears. Someone who cared for and loved them down the years. 
who taught them not to slouch, but stand up straight in line, removed dirty finger, mail, nail, finger marks and dusted every spine, who rearranged the author's names to read from A to Z and sang a gentle lullaby when it was time for bed, who made a fuss of visitors, every little girl or boy, and chose the perfect book each reader might enjoy. Well-known illustrators would often come to call and couldn't leave until they'd left a drawing on the wall. Who is the special someone that all the books admire? The guardian angel of the library has chosen to retire. <laughs> you didn't answer either of his questions. Uh... I'm a poet. No, sorry. <laughs> Were you happy with the reading? Okay, Thanks, good. Um, time for one last question, if anybody's got one. Anybody would like to say anything? Over here? I can't see, I've got a light in my... Hi. Hello. What's my your name? name? My name is Angela, and I just had one quick question. Um, earlier, you guys were talking about um, diversity in books a, a little bit. You bridged that, that subject. I come from a country where they're doing a lot of banning of books because of some of the diversity, some of the subject matter of those books. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear you guys' opinions um, as creators of art. Um, what do you think about the banning of stories? Because people may disagree with them, even if those stories are true and depict some of the things that have been happening to people of specific cultures or backgrounds or whatever. Thank you, Angela. Do you want to start, David? Do you have anything to say? Uh, I mean, I, I follow the stories from a distance and they always seem extraordinary to me, especially because you know, they, they always seem to focus around libraries and schools, which were the, the main source of my education, libraries as much as schools, really. So, so the notion of, of, of that the range of stories being limited in any way, um, especially when it's tied up with, with uh, uh, such extreme political uh, viewpoints is, is 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 really alarming and uh, and and shocking to watch it at at a distance and and sort of incomprehensible to me as well because you know if you what are you what's a school or a library for <laughs> if if not to present those stories so uh, yes it it's it's a, it's a, again a great shame Monica do you want to say anything to that yeah I mean it's um... It's, it is so alarming, and it's the. I mean, what 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 kind of regimes ban books? I mean, we we all know the answer to that, don't we? And when, um, I mean, it's often parents clubbing together, as I've read about it, um, in the states, and lobbying libraries and schools to ban particular books, and. Um, you know, if you don't want your child to read a book, then don't get it out of the library or don't mm. read it to yeah. them. There's plenty of other books to choose from. Um, it's a really alarming trend. And then, you know, on it just it's part of the culture wars, isn't it, I mm -hmm. think, um, which is also an alarming trend. I remember a, a, a few years ago looking at the list of the most banned books in school libraries in, in the States, and the top of the list was, was a... <laughs> Um, a children's book called Walter the Farting Dog. It's <laughs> <laughs> like all round offences to everyone, apparently. <laughs> I well, went out and bought it immediately. <laughs> well, I want, well, I want my books uh, ben, banned in America, uh, a poem actually called uh, At Lunchtime. It was John Ronson did it in his programme recently. Yes. Um, in the sort of, um, yeah, I was. I, I, Religious objected to religious people objected to it. Uh, it's called uh, at lunchtime a story of love about the end of the world coming and people on the love all decided to make love. And but what it was, it wasn't as they I was accused of as they promoting sexual, uh, you know, not at all. It was the opposite. It was saying uh, if you do this, the world will end. Sort of thing, you know. Yeah. But on on a, another point, um, a few years ago I did a book for a well-known publisher. Uh, children's poems and the editor came back and said Roger love, love all the work smashing but teachers will have problems with some of the poems you mentioned so please look at the script you've got and please no mention of relig religion uh, weight or guns 
because teachers will be able to deal with it. So I thought, fair enough. So I got the book, you know, look, religion was a religion part. I don't remember writing about God. Oh, there's one poem yet. It's called No Peas for the Wicked, which went, No peas for the wicked, O Lord, we pray. No, no peas for the wicked, no, no, no sprouts for the shady, and all that sort of thing. But I, I, mentioned, <laughs> I mentioned the word Lord, you see, which is, you know, because some. And then, right, where's the, um, the, where's the guns? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, of course. A poem called High Noon. And so it was about high noon based on, on the film, and it was about the sun and the earth walking toward each other, you know, and who's going to, you know, shoot first? You know, did have guns in, but it was a, a sort of, you know, well, you know. And the other one was um, Wait, about W-E-I-G-H-T, and a poem called um, a Mr. Takeaway, about a man, Monday it's fish and chips, Tuesdays ch chicken chow mein, Wednesdays uh, burger, Thursdays burger again. And it's about that, and he put on weight. Children's part. So I thought, oh God, you know, so I, um, it did worry me. But I was talking in with a few children's writers, uh, Frank uh, Cottrell Boyce and a few others, at a, a literary, I think it's probably Hay and Wire somewhere, about this thing. And uh, one of them said, Roger, I've got an idea for the title of your next book Fat Boy Shoots God. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, <laughs> <laughs> thank you all oh, yeah. so much.